true believers, your somewhat old pal Jason here with another exciting tale of web and intrigue. Today's journey takes us into the PlayStation's Marvel subset collection once again, this time joining everyone's favorite photojournalist Peter Parker in his second outing as the heroic and very amazing Spider-Man. Subtitled Enter Electro, the sequel to Neversoft's original outing is this time handled by Vicarious Visions. Having saved the city the first time around, Spider-Man is once again brought to task by a sinister plot. The stage is set when Spidey discovers an explosive heist and in pursuit uncovers that there's more than just one villain involved. It turns out that Max Dillon, or Electro, is having other devious folks steal various technologically advanced equipment that will create a fancy vest to wear. Once the suit has a proper jewel in its core, the suit will amplify, amplify Electro's powers to almost godlike levels. The actual game begins with the first robbery and has our hero quickly running and swinging through small, open world-like levels chasing his prey. The chase will take him through various city levels, a train yard, laboratories, inside a hostage situation, through a museum, and finally to the top of the world. The main man himself, Stan Lee, narrates each level's introduction, and he also voices various menu options and descriptions. Stan's voice still stands the test of time in terms of charm, and it's one of my favorite little things in the game. While all that sounds exciting, the game is its own tragically flawed character. Since the adventure falls apart as you get closer to the end of the goal, We'll start with the opening positives first. Thanks to it being a sequel, the game retains the comic book style presentation from the first one. While texture sets are reused quite a bit, the memory saved allows for fairly large play areas. The opening city blocks allows for wall climbing, roof hopping, web swinging, and more. Storefronts will explode, items can be picked up and tossed, and more importantly there are plenty of goons to web up and punch. There are little details that help add to the visual flair like newspaper sheets lying in the streets, to vials on desks in the science lab, to copious amounts of buttons in the various control rooms. My favorite level for detail is probably the train yard, as the visual tricks used to initiate lighting elements really gives it a proper night feel. Overall there's some really nice variety in level design, at least in the front half. One mini boss fight will have you fighting Shocker in a burning warehouse, another one will have you chasing after a rolling plane before it collides with a wall, another will have you stealthily taking on six machine gun stations, and so forth. Despite simple wireframes, pretty much every character in the game is textured wonderfully. You can see guards' badges and mustaches, mercenaries have great looking body armor, and the various supervillains like Sandman and Shocker all look like they leapt right out of the comic panels. There's some nice animation to be had as well, with enemies reacting to Spider-Man's various attacks in different ways. Which brings us to Peter's arsenal. For a game that can technically be beaten with minimal use of his various powers, our web slinger is pretty nicely armed. Along with the staple web shot and web swing, players can equip web gauntlets for stronger punches, create an explosive web shield to distance yourself from enemies, standard punches, and the ability to string up villains or yank them aside. Power-ups will allow your web shots elemental abilities like Taser Shock and Ice Blast. Both are essentially just the different ways to do the same thing, but hey, I would never knock a variant. These abilities will be used against gun-wielding bad guys, sentry robots, and more. As you make your way through boss fights, some battles will rely less on Spidey's powers and more on intuition. In both fights with Sandman, the player must use the environment around him more than their web fluid. In the first fight, Sandman creates a sand wall, preventing you from following a train. You need to toss barrels at both the wall and Sandman to get through to the moving locomotive. Against the rolling airplane, you need to remove objects from its path and quickly lock up the engines before it slams into a wall. The most cheeky of the fights is Shocker, who can be stopped in one hit with the right crate being slammed into him. So with all this great attention to detail, where could it have all gone wrong? Like the live-action Spider-Man 3, Enter Electro's third act is where everything comes crumbling down. After an opening gauntlet of tight level design, suddenly things don't make any sense. The, lab the laboratory areas are one sadistic take on the old Mission Impossible break-in sequence. A towering spiral of a room requires you to access a control panel, but the panel is four floors up and only accessible by tiny platforms surrounded by random lightning bolts. No non-mutant human on Earth would be able to reach that panel, which one would need to do if there was an emergency in the lab. This level of absurdity destroys any suspension of disbelief the player has about the world he's now in. When you get to the museum, Electro suddenly has this ability to turn plastic mannequins into sentient robotic samurai, which, having been beaten, leads to the biggest design mishap. You're supposed to climb up a huge tower in the museum to reach the next level, but this tower, which is in a public museum, has no stairs or floors. The only way to get to the top is to either wall climb or treat various monitors, signs, and info booths as platforms. 
in what world would this museum ever exist? Anyone standing on the ground floor can't see past the second story of decorations, and there's no windows looking in from other floors. It's a level design that was only created to serve as a transition rather than a well thought out grounded possibility. You see it all the time in adventure games where you aren't sure if the eventual level boss had to do all the same swinging, climbing, platform jumping you had to do to get to their private room. It also doesn't help that previously mentioned lab and museum tower are also ripe for gamer frustration, since a single jolt from the random electricity bolts immobilize you and drop you to your death. And drop you again. And again. And again. The final boss fight against Electro partially redeems the journey to him, but the overall vibe of the game is too tarnished to completely repair. Adding insult to injury, the end credits are of Spider-Man's voice actor making jokes about the developers, who scan their faces to appear in the credits. If the amount of time spent on the credits had been put towards repairing the last third of the game, the overall package would have been so much more worth it. That isn't to say that the game's a total failure. The parts that shine, shine brightly, and there is a very interesting saving grace, the create a spider suit option. Think of it like a modern day trophy achievement program, but instead of useless point values, you get actual in-game content. Performing various tasks will unlock a suite of various Spider-Man costumes that each uh, have different abilities. Once you have several of them, you can start choosing which pieces of each you'd like to have equipped. Having suffered the wrath of that damn laboratory tower, I picked invincibility and called it a day. In the end, Spider-Man Enter Electro is a fun game that gets tangled up in its own web of destruction. For true Spider-Man fans, the costumes will provide endless replay value and challenges, while the common gamer will find solid ground to stand on while dealing with a few last minute frustrations. If you're looking to pick this one up, it's a very comfortable $10 to $20 game in complete condition. So with that said, let's cover the game's other historical matter, its 9-11 variant. Terror attacks on the World Trade Centers on September 11, 2001 created an interesting problem for media outlets. Radio stations stopped playing certain songs, movie projects were cancelled, and more. Video games were no different. Activision and Vicarious Visions feared that specific parts of the game's contact would hit a little too close for home for those families affected by the tragedy. The game was delayed for several weeks to allow the reprogramming of several areas, including stage names, a video edit, and the climactic battle. What's important to note is that this was not the only video game to have its course altered by the events. Dreamcast's Propeller Arena was cancelled, and PlayStation Siphon Filter 3 had its entire packaging changed, which we'll cover in a later episode. After more than a decade later, the actual release point of the game appears cloudy. The game was originally scheduled to be released alongside X-Men Mutant Academy 2 on September 18th, 2001. Confirmed in an interview with GameSpot and IGN, Activision decided to delay the game's release out of respect for the families and make the changes. What's curious here is that the GameSpot article is written a day before the game's release. Some sites claim that the game was released to stores on August 26, 2001, and then recalled. This presents two problems. The original game's internal timestamp is listed on August 13, 2001 meaning that from the point of Activision creating the Master CD and giving it to Sony for production, Sony would have had to have the game pressed, packaging materials made, and all of it assembled in stores in less than two weeks. While this is supported by several people's claims of having it and not realizing it, the only two known versions were obtained disc only, which means they were more than likely pulled off the manufacturing plant. Considering there is no difference in the disc art between the original and re-released version, if the game really did make it to retail, it's more than likely plausible that it would have the exact same case and manual with no edits. The world may never know. As mentioned, there is no difference in the disc art. In order to tell them apart, the easiest way is to load the game up and just enter the cheat code Ant May, as this will unlock everything, including the level select. Go to the level select screen and scroll through the stages. If the last stage is named on top of the world, you have the 9-11 disc. If it's the best laid plans, then you have the re-released censored version. The only real changes are a small omission to the final level, uh, level movie's intro and the naming of several levels. The game's existence is a very small one. While I haven't tracked it in a while, there seems to be only a handful of them out in the world. Since there isn't a clear-cut number of them known, it is one of the more sought-after items. It should also be stated that it doesn't make it an expensive adventure. I was able to secure mine for about 100 bucks or less years ago, and that's really all it should be worth. The game's ISO can actually be found online with the proper searches, so unless you need $100 worth of about 10 seconds of silence, you can just watch my video on the changes and spend the money on other games. The link to the changes video is below, as well as the link to my game page for the game. 
All right, guys, that does it for this episode. Summer is finally and truly here. The weather is amazing outside. Get outside, hit those garage sales, take walks with a significant other, and absorb all the vitamin D you can get before you get sunburned. Have a great week, and I'll see you next episode. Be safe and take care. Have a good one.